Chapter 14, The Atmosphere. Science and skydiving. Air evolves. The structure and processes of the atmosphere. Solar radiation in the atmosphere. The role of water in the atmosphere. Air pressure, condensation, precipitation, clouds and frontal systems, and winds. Science and skydiving. Kittinger was a captain in the United States Air Force, and in 1960, on August 16th, he jumped from a balloon that had ascended into the atmosphere 20 miles. This is the second highest skydive in history. There was another dude in 2012 that broke the skydiving record. He jumped from a height of 24 miles. He was actually doing research whether astronauts could bail out from a troubled spacecraft that was still in the atmosphere. During his ascent, his balloon expanded and the sky turned black. He was protected by a pressurized suit and an oxygen supply. He could see the curvature of the Earth on the horizon. As he descended, he reached speeds of 614 miles per hour. It took him four minutes before he deployed his parachute. Why do you think it might be easier to hit a home run in Denver than in Chicago? Our atmosphere is a mixture of specific gases around us. The atmosphere protects the Earth from harmful solar radiation and incoming projectiles. The lower boundary touches the surface of the Earth. Upper boundary, the exosphere, is a gradual transition into space. Observed from space, the atmosphere is a thin shell around Earth. If you were to compare it to an apple, the peeling on the apple would be about the thickness of the atmosphere. This is a view of Earth with heavy cloud cover in the southern hemisphere, right here, as seen by Apollo 17. This photograph is a slice through Earth's atmosphere viewed from the space shuttle. What's the atmosphere made of? Mostly nitrogen. In fact, it's about 70% nitrogen and only 21% oxygen. CO2 is a very small component, but it plays a large role in the greenhouse effect. Water vapor in the air can range from 0% over deserts to 7% in humid climates. Is the atmosphere the Earth stable, or is it changing with time? And why would it change? Here's a breakdown of the gases that are actually in the atmosphere. 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. And this little sliver right here, this purple colored sliver, would be less than 1% argon, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor, and there are other gases in there as well. This is only about 1% of what's in the atmosphere. Having an atmosphere is not unique to Earth, but our atmosphere's composition is unique. Venus and Earth began with very similar atmospheres, rich in carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and oxygen. The atmospheres originated from gases expelled from extensive volcanism and collision with comets and meteorites. Venus, being closer to the sun, had abundant water vapor. This vapor was split into hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen was lost to space. The remaining oxygen bonded with carbon and yielded abundant CO2. 
The CO2 blanket around Venus insulates the planet and it keeps Venus at a very comfortable temperature of 867 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. On Earth, no oxygen was present 4 billion years ago. As the Earth cooled, water condensed, it rained, removed the CO2 from the atmosphere, Early primitive organisms used photosynthesis to consume the CO2 and produced oxygen. The oxygen accumulated in the oceans but not the atmosphere until about 2 billion years ago. Oxygen is reactive and combined with other elements in early rocks. The key point is that life came before free oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. The earliest animals lived in the oceans. The oceans protected them from harmful solar radiation. Once oxygen accumulated in Earth's atmosphere, life could be sustained on land. And this is also when the ozone layer developed, protecting life on land from the ultraviolet rays. The atmospheric oxygen concentration during Earth's history is shown in these two graphs. Up here, the oxygen levels growing. This is the age of Earth in billions of years. The oxygen levels fluctuated between 12 and 30 percent over the last 422 million years. Gravity actually holds 99 percent of the atmospheric gases within 20 miles of the surface. The density of air rapidly decreases with increasing altitude. So the farther away from the surface of the Earth you get, the less dense the air is. The accepted boundary with space is 62 miles above Earth's surface. Now this varies. It's not like, oh, it's 62 miles and here's the line. It can be 62.3, it can be 59.9. It's going to vary a little bit. Some gas must extend as high as 312 miles high as spacecraft can feel drag up to this altitude. Atoms in the water or air are constantly in motion and this is kinetic energy. Kinetic means moving. Kinetic energy increases as speed of atomic motion increases. Heat is different than temperature. Heat is the total kinetic energy of all the atoms in a substance. The temperature is the average of the kinetic energy of a substance measured for a given quantity of the substance. Let's say you have two pans sitting on the eyes of a stove. One of them has twice as much water in it as the other one. They contain the same amount of heat, which is spread among the water molecules in each pan. But the water in pan two has a higher temperature as the heat would have produced more rapid motion among fewer molecules. The ocean would have more heat than a pan of boiling water would. Remember, water has a high heat capacity. In other words, it must absorb a lot of heat to produce a corresponding temperature increase. The heat capacity of air is one quarter that of water. If the same amount of heat were applied to similar masses of air and water, which would experience a greater temperature increase? Air would experience a greater temperature increase as it really doesn't take as much heat to raise the temperature of a given mass of air versus water. The atmosphere has layers. The four main layers, they're called the thermal layers, the ones that contain heat, are shown on this graph. The troposphere, down here, is the layer that actually touches the surface of the Earth. 
it shows a decrease in temperature. Notice here's zero and minus 20, minus 40, minus 60. The temperature goes down as you head toward the left. And the altitude is along this graph. As you go higher in the troposphere, the temperature decreases. The troposphere gets its warmth from Earth's surface, not from the sun. The sun does not heat the troposphere directly. The troposphere contains our weather systems. It also contains air pollution. The bulk of air and aerosols are in the troposphere. The thickness varies based on its thermal character. The thickest part is about 10 miles and that's over the equator. And the thinnest part of the troposphere is about five miles thick, and that's over the poles. 90% of the Earth's atmosphere is contained within this layer. Between the troposphere and the next layer, which is the stratosphere, there's a transition zone. Each of these zones are called a pause. This one is called a tropopause because it's above the troposphere. Once we get into the stratosphere, the temperature begins to increase. It's over 25 miles thick and it contains about 20% of the atmosphere's air. This is in the stratosphere. Actually, the stratosphere is where most airplanes fly because there's less air resistance there. Also in the stratosphere, you'll find the ozone layer. Ozone's different than regular oxygen as it has three molecules of oxygen stuck together rather than two. Oxygen is O2, ozone is O3. The higher kinetic energy with nothing to bump into is here. The cool air of the troposphere cannot rise into the stratosphere. The stratopause, which transitions into the mesosphere. Meso meaning middle. This is the middle layer. Yes, it's the middle. I know on the graph it shows just the thermosphere being above it, but beyond that there's the exosphere. So this would be the middle layer. It has decreasing air temperatures in the mesosphere. They're about minus 139 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature decreases due to fewer and fewer ozone molecules to absorb the solar UV radiation here. There's very little oxygen and nitrogen. There's very, very few molecules in the mesosphere at all. There is sufficient gases to burn up incoming debris, however. Most near-Earth objects burn up in this layer. Thermosphere is after the mesosphere, as you move farther away from the surface. In the thermosphere, thermo meaning heat, it gets warmer the farther away from Earth's surface you get. This blocks most of the harmful cosmic radiation the x-rays, the gamma rays, and some of the ultraviolet is blocked in the thermosphere. There are very few gas molecules here. The heat energy is actually very low. Gases here are ionized. They're broken into ions as solar radiation strips them of electrons. The ionized gases cause the auroras, which the interaction near the magnetic poles of electrons and protons from the sun. There are auroras in both the northern and the southern hemispheres. Solar radiation and the atmosphere. The light comes from the sun and there are different wavelengths. Here is the visible light. There's also light that we cannot see. There's ultraviolet light. There's very, very short wavelengths that our eyes are not able to see. And there are longer wavelengths that our eyes cannot see. Over here, 
the relative proportions of solar radiation reaching the Earth. The infrared and the visible light make up more than 90% of solar radiation at the Earth's surface. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. The highest energy radiation is absorbed in the thermosphere, which is next to the exosphere. Solar radiation, x-rays, ultraviolet, and gamma rays are absorbed in the thermosphere. Actually prevents us humans from becoming crispy. Visible light and radiation associated with heat are the most common wavelengths that reach Earth's surface. The ozone hole, it's not really a hole, it's more like a thinning of the layer. Ozone, remember, is O3. What are the consequences when we lose ozone? More ultraviolet rays get to the Earth. We get sunburn. What happens to the EMR that reaches Earth's surface? Well, it can be scattered. It can change direction when it hits particles and gas molecules. This is what causes the blue color of the sky. Blue light is scattered more easily than other colors. And this scattered blue light reaches our eyes, making the sky blue. Higher in the atmosphere, fewer gas molecules, less scattering, and the sky appears black like it did to Felix when he was 24 miles above the earth doing his skydive. It can be reflected. The incoming radiation can be reflected off gas molecules and return the space. It can also be reflected off surface features. Now there is something called the albedo effect. It's the reflectivity of a surface. Ice is very reflective. Forests and water are not as reflective. Some of the EMR is absorbed. It interacts with materials in the atmosphere and is converted to some other form of energy, usually heat. Atmospheric gases absorb certain wavelengths. The thermosphere absorbs short wavelengths, the X-rays and the gamma rays. Ozone in the stratosphere absorbs the UV, or the ultraviolet. The water vapor and the CO2 in the troposphere absorb infrared. And then the surface absorbs most of the heat. I know that some of the um, heat is absorbed in other parts of the atmosphere, but most of the heat is absorbed by the surface. Some solar radiation reaches Earth's surface, and some of this is absorbed by the land and oceans. Warming the planet, about half of the incoming solar radiation heats the Earth. So 51% is absorbed at Earth's surface. There's evaporation is 23%, infrared 21%. Conduction and convection, those are types of heat transfer, is 7%. The incoming solar radiation, 100%. 19% of it is absorbed by the clouds. 30% is scattered and reflected from clouds, atmosphere, and Earth's surface. Here's the Earth's albedo, the re reflectivity of light. Earth's albedo is about 31% on average. Fresh snow reflectivity is 80 to 95%. A light colored roof is about 35 to 50%. It just bounces off. A dark roof, only 8 to 18% bounces off. Crops and grassland, 10 to 25%. Crops and grassland, 10 to 25 percent. The oceans, 10 percent. 10 percent would be at the higher sun angle, and 60 percent would be at the lower sun angle. The greenhouse effect. Surfaces on Earth with a low albedo absorb the solar radiation and then re-radiate it as
as infrared or the long wavelength radiation. The long wavelength infrared radiation is then absorbed by greenhouse gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and other trace gases, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, that are all in the troposphere. This absorption causes the troposphere to warm, and this is the greenhouse effect. It keeps Earth a livable approximately 33 degrees Celsius or 91 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than if there were no greenhouse effect. Life on Earth would not exist if there were zero greenhouse effect we would all freeze to death. We need the greenhouse effect. We just don't need it to be any warmer than what it is. The average surface temperature of Earth would be about zero degrees without the greenhouse effect as opposed to current average of about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Venus, with so much CO2 in its atmosphere, has a runaway greenhouse effect, resulting in surface temperatures of up to 867 degrees Fahrenheit. The role of water in the atmosphere. Water is the only substance that exists in all three states on Earth's surface. What do I mean by states? I mean solid liquid gas. Frozen, it's ice. Not frozen, it's water. It can evaporate and change into a gas, otherwise known as water vapor. When it's water vapor, it is a greenhouse gas. The atmosphere contains a small portion of the Earth's water. Water is constantly cycled through the atmosphere. Conversion of water from one state to another transfers energy throughout the troposphere and it does not have to go from solid to a liquid to a gas. It can go directly from a solid to a gas. Water molecules are dipolar, which means the opposite charges on each end of the molecule, the net partial negative charge on the oxygen atom and the net partial positive charge on one hydrogen atom. States of water are defined by the distance between water molecules and their degree of motion. This means that as a solid ice, it's very closely spaced. They move less. They're more ordered. They're compacted. In a liquid, there are small groups of molecules and they're attached and their rapid movement creates some disorder. They're able to slip by one another. In a gas, the individual molecules move very rapidly and therefore don't attract and join. They're very, very disordered and far apart. Whenever water changes state, that change is accompanied by an absorption or a release of heat. Latent heat is the amount of heat absorbed or released as water changes state. The heat is absorbed during melting, evaporation, or sublimation, which is when a solid changes to gas, ice to water vapor. Heat is released during freezing, condensation, or deposition, a gas to a solid. Much more latent heat is released or absorbed during changes between liquid and gaseous states than during changes between solid and liquid states. Evaporation and condensation are extremely important. They occur over very large areas. They contribute to the weather phenomena and redistribution of heat in the atmosphere. Humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. It's determined by evaporation and condensation. Hot and humid go together. Higher temperatures cause evaporation to dominate, allowing more moisture in the air. So the warmer the air is, the more water vapor it can hold. 
Air is saturated when it can hold no more water vapor at a given temperature. Absolute humidity is the mass of water in a volume of air. Relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air compared to how much water vapor could be in the air at that particular temperature. Relative humidity is what the weatherman reports on the weather forecast. When cold air moves over warm water, some of the warm water evaporates. Steam and fog. When warm air moves over cold water, the air cools. The dew point is the temperature that air must reach in order to become saturated. As a matter of fact, that's when dew will form on the grass. Condensation occurs when the relative humidity of air increases enough that the air becomes saturated with moisture. Humidity can increase in two ways. The addition of water or a decrease in temperature. Atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by the weight of an overlying column of air. Air pressure declines with increasing altitude. Air pressure is influenced by air density. Air density measurement of the mass of atoms and molecules of gases per volume of air. Gravity pulls most gases toward Earth's surface. Air density is therefore the highest at Earth's surface. 50% of all the air lies below 3 miles in altitude. This is a barometer which measures air pressure. The lower the air pressure, the more chance it is going to rain. Air contracts when it's cooled, increasing the density and the air pressure. Air expands when it's warm, decreasing the density and the air pressure. The highest air pressures are found in cold regions. The lowest air pressures are found in tropical warm environments. In fact, around the equator of the globe, the air is actually rising. And at about 30 degrees latitude north and south, the air is sinking. This circulation is called a Hadley cell. Air pressure decreases rapidly at lower altitudes where air density is greatest and decreases slowly at higher altitudes. Compressed air becomes warmer because the molecules get closer together and there's more friction between the molecules. Expanding air becomes cooler. The molecules are not bumping into one another. Tire pressures are typically twice that of the surrounding air. When you release the air, the air coming out feels colder than the surrounding air. This is the conversion of heat to mechanical energy, which is net cooling. This is a adiabatic change. It occurs due to a change in pressure with no loss or gain of energy to or from the surrounding air. An example. The burn-up of a meteor entering the atmosphere. The burn-up is not a result of frictional heating. The incoming meteor slows down as it compresses the gases of the upper atmosphere in front of it. It causes the air temperature around the meteor to rise. Rising air cools for two reasons. It is expanding and cooling due to decreasing air pressure. And it's moving farther away from the warm surface of the Earth. As a parcel of air rises, the total amount of energy present does not change, but 
it can be used to either maintain a constant temperature or to work to expand the size of the air parcel. As the air expands, heat is distributed through a larger volume, producing a cooling effect. As rising air cools, its relative humidity increases and the air eventually becomes saturated. Precipitation will occur, which releases latent heat. This latent heat counterbalances the adiabatic cooling, which reduces the cooling rate. Clouds form when the air rises, cools off, and the water vapor condenses and the water vapor must have a surface to condense onto. Each raindrop has a small microscopic piece of dust, smoke, salt, or some sort of pollutant in the air. Clouds are composed of billions of tiny water droplets that may eventually combine to form rain, snow, or hail. Heavier cloud droplets fall and collide and combine with other droplets to form raindrops. One raindrop contains about one million cloud droplets. Pure water droplets in high clouds can remain liquid down to 38 degrees below Fahrenheit. Supercooled water will only freeze if it is agitated or has a surface to freeze on. Snow forms when the cloud reaches temperatures below five degrees below zero Celsius, whereby air needs a little less water vapor to be saturated for ice than for water. Condensation will preferentially produce ice crystals. Miniature ice crystals act as condensation surfaces. These ice crystals act as condensation surfaces and gradually increase in size to form snowflakes. The prefix C-I-R-R -R means a high level wispy type cloud. Alto refers to mid-level. Cumulus means heaped up or puffy. Nimbo or nimbus is a rain cloud. Stratus is a sheet light cloud that covers the whole sky. These prefixes and suffixes can be combined to describe different types of clouds. For example, this is a cirrocumulus cloud. Here is a stratocumulus cloud. Clouds are classified on the basis of their altitude and what they look like. Look at this cloud. It looks kind of puffy, it looks like a pile of cotton balls. Over here, these are wispy. These are zero. Why does air rise? Air rises naturally if it's lighter than the surrounding air masses, or if it's less dense. Frontal lifting is two large air masses of different densities. The place where they meet, their boundary, is a front. The term front comes from war. It's the front line. And actually, the frontal boundary is described as a war between two different air masses with different densities, different temperatures. The lighter, warm air will rise above the colder, denser air. Whenever you hear about a front moving in, the front describes the, the temperature of the air mass behind it. There's orographic lifting. That's air that's forced to rise over an obstruction, such as mountains. There's also convergence lifting. That's when two air masses of similar temperature forces some air upward, since both air masses cannot occupy the same space. 
clouds and frontal systems. Here's a drawing of Florida, and here's a satellite photograph of Florida, the Atlantic Ocean on this side and the Gulf of Mexico on this side. When the air rises above the land, it usually forms some big clouds. And I know from personal experience in the afternoons, almost every afternoon, there's going to be some sort of thunderstorm. This is in the summertime usually. That's why Florida is known as the lightning capital of the world. The wind is the horizontal movement of air that occurs from differences in air pressure. The air always moves from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. As a matter of fact, heat moves that way as well. It always moves from high temperature to low temperature areas, just like wind moves from higher pressure to lower pressure. Wind is characterized by its speed and direction, and wind is always named after the direction that it comes from. If it's an east wind, it's coming from the east. If it's a sea breeze, it's coming from the sea. If it's a land breeze, it's coming from the land. An isobar on a weather map signifies areas of similar air pressure. Isobar, a barometer measures air pressure. So this would be a line of barometer showing the air pressure. A pressure gradient is the magnitude of the change in pressure between two points divided by the distance between the two points. The greater the contrast in pressure, the steeper the gradient and the faster the winds. The closer together the isobars, the steeper the gradient and the faster the wind. Due to the Coriolis effects, winds are deflected to the right of their course in the northern hemisphere. Eventually, Pressure gradient balances Coriolis effect and winds move parallel to isobars, geostrophic winds. Winds blowing near Earth's surface are slowed by frictional drag from the surface. Friction is most dramatic over rugged surfaces. Cyclone and anticyclone. This drawing indicates a cyclone area which rotates clockwise at the surface. This would be a high pressure area. Anticyclone is a lower pressure area. It creates a counterclockwise airflow. Here's a photograph of a field containing wind turbines for the purpose of making electricity. This map shows a typical wind velocity across the United States. Where would the construction of wind turbines make the most sense? Wind energy. More than 3% of energy generated in the United States is wind energy. Wind velocities must be greater than 12 miles per hour to make wind turbines viable. What are some of the advantages of wind energy and what are some drawbacks? I know from seeing this myself, but there are far more wind turbines in Europe than there are in the United States. As we get into hurricanes, we will be discussing this further. I know you've heard the weatherman talk about the upper atmospheric winds are cutting off the top of the hurricane and it's making it weaker. Well, here's a drawing of that particular occurrence. 